All right, uh, I think we're live. Hi, everybody. Uh, hello to everybody here in the room and also uh, watching on Twitch. Um, so, yeah, um, welcome to uh, the latest in the NYU Game Center lecture series talks. Um, so we've got some special guests with us here today, really excited. Um, those of you on the stream that uh, don't know me, so I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Mitty Kandeka. I'm a um, professor here, a member of faculty at the Game Center. Um, and so today, really, really excited to welcome some uh, very special guests. So uh, we have uh, Bryna Dabby Smith, who is in the middle oh. there, <laughs> who is CEO um, of Brass Line Entertainment. Uh, we have Manveer Her, who is uh, the President and Chief Visionary Officer. And then we also have a extra bonus special guest today, uh, <laughs> who is uh, Just Blaze. So welcome to the Game Center, everybody. Um, round of applause, Thank you. yay. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, really, really excited to welcome uh, everybody here today. So um, basically, and also I just want to explain as well, uh, uh, so Brass Lion um, so is a new uh, AAA studio headquartered right here in, uh, right here in New York. Um, some really just like awesome work they're doing, really excited about everything. Um, there's actually, we have two of the three co-founders here though. So um, in the picture that you see there, we actually have Rashad Reddick, who is the third co-founder, um, who is hopefully watching on the Twitch stream at home, um, is not here with us today. Um, but yeah, I just want to sort of kick off and uh, I think we're just going to be chatting about all of the amazing things that you're doing, um, talking about kind of the business side of like setting up a new studio, um, and then just one of the things I'm super excited about Brass Lion is um, you have a, a very specific mission with the studio, right? And it's uh, uh, something that's very close to my heart. So um, Manveer, why don't you just like tell us, give us like the elevator pitch for Brass Lion. Like what is the, I'm sure you've done this like a whole bunch. <laughs> uh, I'm out of practice, but uh, yeah, it's Brass Lion is a AAA studio focused on building games for black and brown and other marginalized voices. We want to center those voices both in the workplace itself and also in the products that we create. And so we think that we have you know, a unique set of talents and a really great team that just be able to put out some amazing products into the marketplace in the near future. Awesome. Um, yeah, so you know, I think um, it's super excited to have a AAA studio who's like coming at it from that angle, doing that work. So, and then I think the other thing that's really um, amazing is just kind of the um, just the kind of experience, the wealth of experience that like the founders of Brass Lion have, um, having come from. Uh, can you hear me still? Yeah, just make sure all the mics are on. Oh, whoops! Is everyone? Yes, one, two. Yeah. Cool. Mine doesn't seem like it's all I've been trying since. Did you try it? There we go. Cool. All right, I can also pass my mic around if, if that's going to be easier, but I think everyone's... It's on. It's not on. His is dead. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, while, we're, while we're fixing the mic issues, um, so I guess we'll, we'll get started and sort of dig into each of your backgrounds, because I think that's kind of one of the things that's really amazing. Like, you each... Um, like each person involved kind of represents like just a lot of, uh, a lo just a lot of shipped games, <laughs> a lot of experience. Um, and so just, you know, you formed this kind of powerhouse of a AAA studio, as I said, headquartered right here in New York. So um, just want to dig into kind of each of your backgrounds, because I think one of the things that's uh, exciting is that, you know, you come from different disciplines as well. So it'd be really awesome for uh, our audience to hear a bit more about that. So. Um, why don't we start with, so I've got some of your, uh, uh, got a slide here with some of your uh, stuff that you've worked on. So Munvir, why don't we, uh, why don't we talk, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the things, like your sort of general path into the industry and some of the things that you've like worked on to date. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I started, I did basically did a computer science degree at Virginia Tech. Uh, with a minor in math, 
After I graduated, I started as a programming intern at Big Huge Games, working on a, a RTS called Rise of Legends. Uh, I was there for a very short period of time before I went over to Wisconsin, uh, and I worked for, at the uh, Raven Software, where I got to work on the Wolfenstein game. Um, shipped that. I worked on another uh, title that I became. And during my tenure at Raven, I shifted from being like a gameplay programmer. Um, to more of a game designer, because there weren't really game designers there, and I was doing a lot of that work. And that's always what I was more interested in. Code was always just my path to get into that world. Um, and so I became the first game designer at Raven, um, and then kind of moved up to lead designer on a project that got canceled. Um, Raven got put on support for all, every Call of Duty game from the last decade. Um, I wasn't personally interested in working on any Call of Duty games. Um, you know, I know a lot of people love them, but it just wasn't for me creatively. So I bounced and I went to Bioware, uh, the Montreal studio, uh, and I got the chance to work on one of my favorite franchises, which was the Mass Effect franchise. Um, so I started at the very beginning of Mass Effect 3. I was there just a few months in. Uh, I got to work on all of Mass Effect 3 as a game designer. So I worked on the class design, the powers, all that sort of thing. Um, worked on DLC and stuff like that. Uh, and then became sort of, sort of like the, uh, one of the senior combat designers in charge of the combat on Mass Effect Andromeda and built up a lot of the combat systems. And, um, you know, for as divisive as the game has been, the, the combat was one of those things that was always called out as being the strong point of, the, of that game. And I was really proud of the team that we were able to, you know, deliver that kind of high vision. So that was my kind of trajectory um, up to before starting Brass Lion. And then... Basically, in 2017, I was real sick of the AAA industry. I was really disillusioned with a lot of things, really upset about a lot of decisions that had been made, um, and I decided, fuck it, I'm just going to start my own studio, um, and I started what became now Brass Line Entertainment. Yeah, and we'll, we'll dig more into that for sure, um, but Brian, I would love to hear a bit more about your kind of path into, uh, into sure. the industry. Um, so I came from production, and like a lot of people in production, it was not a linear path. It was a very uh, unusual one. Um, I started in, I'm old, so I started in 99, um, <laughs> and I came from Vancouver. So um, my very first industry job was as a production coordinator at um, Electronic Arts, which is EA Sports. Um, and I did that for five and a half years. Um, and it was sort of, it was like the internship and trial by fire learning process. It was, uh, I'd actually dropped out of college, so it was really school for me in a mm. lot of ways. Um, and it was uh, amazing and also exhausting. <laughs> um, I worked on, <laughs> thank you. I worked on um, a lot of different titles. So uh, Def Jam. Yeah, this is just a, like a small slice of the many, many yeah. things you've shipped. As a production coordinator early on, I worked on a lot of titles. So all of the sports titles, everything from FIFA, NHL, Def Jam Vendetta, Need for Speed, uh, NBA Street, Volume 2. Uh, I'm forgetting something, probably. Um, Rock the Rink, hockey. Um, and after um, leaving... You said today, NBA Street, right? Like, I did. Yeah, I love yeah. that game. Someone here is really familiar with NBA Street. Okay, yeah, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> after, uh, after leaving EA, I spent two years, um, I took a break from games, and I spent two years as a project manager at a more traditional design firm mm -hmm. before getting uh, coaxed back into game development. Um, and I actually moved to San Diego, where I became uh, an associate producer and then a producer at High Moon Studios, which was at the time, and I apologize, it's a long story, which was at the time of, uh, of Vivendi Studio. We then went through the Activision merger and it became an Activision Studio. Um, we shipped the Born Conspiracy, which was my first um, official producer, producer credit, which was, mm. I was very proud of, it was a pretty big deal. Um, and then we started working on Transformers uh, War for Cybertron and uh, I had to move back to Canada because of my work visa. Mm. So I ended up having to leave. Um, and from there, I worked at, uh, I was a project manager at United Front Games on Sleeping Dogs, which I'm also very proud of. So um, there they had more of the, the electronic arts um, uh, version of producers are more on the creative side. And so they had project managers, which were producers in other studios. So I managed the fighting, shooting, running teams um, and UI. I forget what else, it's been a minute. Um, and from there, I worked at, uh, I went to uh, Smoking Gun Interactive, and we actually shipped uh, a Microsoft title called Connect Adventures, which went in the box with every Connect that came out when they first shipped it, which was a whole different type of excitement. 
Um, and after that, I started my own studio for the very first time, uh, which was a mobile studio with uh, two partners, which uh, we did for two years before I got, uh, again, uh, sort of called away and I managed to uh, move to New York um, to work outside of games one more time as the director of production at uh, a non-game studio, um, actually doing uh, agency work. Mm -hmm. So we did, I did that for a couple of years and then actually worked with them externally a bit on my own. Um, and then in 2017, uh, mm -hmm. I, went, I went for brunch with uh, the two of you <laughs> um, and just had a nice conversation about uh, this, this new studio that Manvir was, was starting on his own. He was really excited about it. And uh, at the time, I kind of casually said, oh, that sounds great. Well, if you need help with you know, the schedule or budgets or whatever, let me know. And he went, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. You see, I helped broker this deal. That's uh, what you all need to know. <laughs> um, uh, more on that later. Um, but uh, no, so I mean, just again, incredible wealth of, uh, of industry experience, like within games and outside of games as well. Um, and then uh, finally, last but not least, um, just some of the things that Rashad, uh, who is not here again, so there's a picture of him up here. Um, some of the things that Rashad has worked on um, include um, uh, Skyrim, which you mentioned is like the 20, uh, the, the 10, I think it's the 10 year anniversary. Yeah. yeah. The launch was today. today. Wow, that's wild, yeah. Um, doesn't seem that long ago. Uh, Fallout 3, uh, Crisis 3, just like, again, incredible, uh, incredible sort of uh, wealth of experience there. Um, finally, um, since you're just, you're our special bonus edition guest, I didn't prepare like a slide of your game credits, but you, uh, in addition to being legendary producer Just Blaze, um, in, who's worked obviously with tons of artists, you actually have a pretty extensive um, game credit list as well. I've worked on a few games, yes. Cool. Do you want to talk to us about it? Um, hey, guys. My name is uh, Just Blaze. I'm a producer, DJ, <coughs> um, and, um, and gamer. Um, grew up, uh, you know, my, uh, the Atari 2600 changed my life. You know, I'm old. They're old, but actually, well, you're older than me, but we're all old. Um, but yeah, the, the Atari and the, uh, the the Atari and the Sega Master System were life changers for me, as well as the Sega Genesis was. And uh, one of the things from when I was young, you know, playing all these games, I, I grew up in the era, not to say that game scores aren't great now, but I grew up in that era, or I became of age in that era where... Uh, you know, between like the Z80 processor in the Sega Master System versus the uh, Yamaha processor in the Sega Genesis, all of a sudden you went from being able to play like three sounds at once to like, you know, 16 sounds at once. So like as soon as I'm becoming aware of who I am as a person and what I love musically, all of a sudden these uh, game consoles can, you know, were able to get real composers in um, and create real music as opposed to just bleeps and bloops, you know, so... As much as I was influenced by the dance music and the hip hop music that I was listening to back then, I was also influenced by themes like, you know, like uh, games like Revenge of Shinobi, Alex Kidd in Miracle World, um, Zillion, um, and I can go on about that for days. Space Harrier, especially, um, Streets of Rage. Um, and uh, so that stuff was just as much of my, a part of my upbringing as was the other stuff that I was doing. So, Eventually, it all came full circle for me, and I was asked in, I think, 2001 to uh, have take a meeting with EA Sports, and I ended up working on a long list of games from there, which includes um, NBA Live uh, 2003, 4, and 5, NBA Street, uh, Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition, or one of the, one of the Street Fighter 4s. <laughs> um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows, uh, NBA Ballers for Midway, um, I, oh, your yeah, Def Jam Vendetta. I can't remember all of them, but I, I ended up doing a lot of, uh, of game work, not just um, for the in-game in scoring, but also um, there were a couple of times where I'd get approached because they felt like the commercials that they were editing weren't really coming together correctly. And they wanted to use my music in the commercials, so they'd call me and say, hey, do you want to just do the commercials as well? So I was able to not only score the games, but kind of recut the commercials according to what I had put together musically for them. 
Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of been one of my things for the last 20 years. And um, somehow ended up hanging out with these guys. <laughs> and um, I'm super proud of what they've done so far. I'm happy and proud to be a part of it. And um, Brass Line, is the Army better yet the Navy? <laughs> Um, that's amazing. I, I didn't realize like just how many games you'd worked on. So yeah, you might have more ship titles than either of us. Right <laughs> there we go. Um, no, that's that's incredible to hear. Um, so uh, I want to sort of start again at the sort of impetus for um, starting Brass Lion and the ways in which you know having worked in the industry and knowing sort of what it's like, et cetera, and having had the experiences you've had, like what was, so you mentioned, you know, you, um, 2017 Monver, you um, had a moment of being like, I'm done with this. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what that process was like for you? Sure. Um, I was frankly really angry. Uh, I was kind of disillusioned with the crunch, um, the not caring about people of color and centering those voices. I thought about that a lot at Bioware and felt like, my voice wasn't heard and other people of color's voices weren't heard in the way that we needed to be. And I wasn't happy with the way the sad situation. Um, and I wasn't happy with the way that project was developed as a whole. Um, and so like I knew that just going to another one of these big studios in the industry was just gonna put me in the same situation again. And I didn't think I had the mental health to do that again. Um, and so for me, it was a breaking point of do I quit this industry? And if I do, what the hell do I do? Because I've, I've wanted to make video games since I was 13. Like, I decided I was going to make video games since I was 13 years old. And, like, I've just worked at it and learned, learned, taught myself to code, all that kind of stuff, you know, since then. Um, and so instead, I tried to use that anger and that fire inside of me to be a positive force, you know. The idea that, you know, a, you know an, an explosion can be a rocket that goes to the moon or it can be a bomb that blows up, and I'd rather be a rocket to go to the moon. Um, and so... Uh, to try to channel all of that kind of frustration and thought about, well, what frustrates me about it and what's the ideal workplace that I've never gotten to work at? Like, what's the place that I always wish existed for younger me before I had to go through all the, all the churn and the crunch and all that kind of stuff? And that's sort of where the idea for Brass Line came from. Um, and just a sort of level set for everybody as well. Um, so... Um, obviously, so that was 2017 you started, now in 2021, um, just to sort of, you know, um, obviously you're a AAA studio, can you just sort of explain for everybody, like, what that means exactly? Is that kind of in terms of, like, um, you know, like, uh, funding, or like, the, the scale of game funding and then uh, quality, like, can you speak a bit more to that? Sure. Um, AAA, uh, there's always a lot of conversation about, you know, whether those terms should change a little bit, but... Um, we are still an indie studio in that we are um, wholly owned by us, but we um, are AAA in terms of the type of quality of game right. and the scale of game that we're developing. Um, we're doing something pretty big, so it's AAA game development. Uh, yeah. And that means we're building a decent-sized team. Yeah, and we'll talk about um, sort of like building that team, but I want to sort of, again, talk about, talking about that kind of funding journey. Um, so... You know, can you talk a little bit about like what that funding that so right now um, you're at a place where you're obviously hiring, you're growing, you're you're in a good place uh, it seems uh, by all accounts. Um, but what was it like to get there? Like, what are the different um, sort of things you encountered? Uh, yeah, if you can speak to that. Oh, I guess I'm going to speak to that. Okay. Um, yeah, so after Manvir slowly pulled me into this with him, uh, we started having those conversations, and he was already um, having some initial conversations with yeah. um, an agent at CAA by the name of Matthew Cohen, who uh, is quite honestly a fabulous human, which is not what you always expect out of an agent at CAA, um, but he is, and he has a lot of heart and a lot of um, belief in, in what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, he really sort of, we resonated with him and he resonated with us. So Matthew started setting up meetings. You know, you can have all of those sort of conversations about... There's a lot of different routes to go as a, as a game studio. You can be um, in fully independent and you can just you know, bootstrap and try and do it yourself as long as possible. Um, that is a really, really tough road to go, especially if you're trying to build a larger scale project. Um, you can take private investment and there's a lot of different ways that that can go. You can do publisher deals. Those are a wide range of, of options, large and small and in between. Um, and uh, they're, they're just not created equal, but there's different fits for different people. So you always want to find the, the best possible way as a studio, and that's sort of what we did. 
to have as many of those conversations as possible out of the gate and feel out the different situations and see what makes sense for you. Um, because for, for one team, and we can't talk about what we're doing, it's gonna be some time before we can do that. Um, but for one team, you know, private funding might make the most sense. For another team, a publisher deal might make the most sense. It just depends on what you're trying to build and where your best fit is. So we went out and we took a lot of meetings, and when I say a lot of meetings, I mean we went to DICE, we went to GDC, we went to E3, we met, we did speed round conversations. You, you go to these, these conferences and you will see the same people doing this like, it looks like speed dating for video games, where they're all just like switching tables and you literally kind of nod to each other throughout the day because you see everyone. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty intense, but it's also, if you really want to nail what it is you're working on, there's no better way to get your elevator pitch down than do it like 50 times in one day. So we went through that together out of the gate. We had all those conversations and um, we, we, it took us quite some time to figure out what the best possible situation was for us. Um, and even before that, because like Monday you were already taking like meetings and things like that, like how did you, how did you get from that moment of being like, cool, I'm gonna start my own studio um, to then like get it? Because obviously for, um, and you're obviously coming at it from a different sort of, um, stage in your career, right? Because you're, um, uh, you know, you uh, were looking to, you have a number of ship titles, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very different from like, um, you know, a recent graduate, et cetera, starting out. Um, but can you just speak a little bit to uh, what those initial steps were that you took? Yeah, so actually um, I spent a lot of 2017 here in New York uh, I spent some of it sleeping on your Crashing couch. Crashing on my couch. Uh, Again, so I'm like... I'm shout out to Dr. Mitsu for Secret giving me the couch. fourth <laughs> co-founder of Rothlion right here. Definitely. Uh, where's my shares? He's, he's really our unofficial fourth, fourth already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I got like a sublease in South Brooklyn. Uh, I actually had really bad internet in that place. And so I ended up coming right here, right by here, and got a WeWork space for myself. And I started developing a concept that became um, a project that we're not currently working on as a video game, but we are working on as a podcast. And that's Corner Wolves, and right? That's, yes, Corner Wolves. And it was set in 1990s Harlem around an Afro-Latina whose father is murdered outside the bodega that the family runs and her falling into like the world of crime mm -hmm. as she tries to discover who murdered her father. Um, and so I, I envisioned it as a game first. And I just started working on the deck, literally in Brooklyn, uh, coming up with a visiting Harlem, you know, like Harlem was a, a place I always visited as, you know, I grew up in the, uh, outside of DC in Maryland. Uh, and so every time I'd come up to New York, I'd spend a good, good amount of chunk of my, my youth going uptown uh, and spending good time there. So started developing that and I was talking to a few friends who worked at publishers mm -hmm. and they gave me some advice. Like they were like, hey, well, I can take a meeting with you, but this is the kind of things that we're gonna be looking for. Mm -hmm. And I tried to listen to that feedback and kind of craft a pitch that was interesting. Um, and so I then started pitching that out through our agent because I signed with the agent actually before Brian had fully joined, joined on. Um, uh, through the agency, like started taking meetings, talked to VCs and, and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of those formative, formative steps happened here in New York and it always felt like if you were gonna start a company about people of color and centering folks of color's voices, there's no better city in the country than, than New York City to me. Um, and I'm an East Coast guy, so that made a lot of sense. So coming back from Canada after nine years, you know, kind of made sense. So um, that was a lot of the formation, formative steps for me. So the reason I'm getting you to sort of dig into that a little bit, because even with um, sort of, you know, the, the games you've shipped and your experience, it still took a while, right, to get from that oh, yeah. initial Many, moment. A lot of notes, a lot of notes. To, well, and I a lot of no's like, and, and also just because uh, it wasn't all no's, there was a lot of interest, but there was, it was, uh, it, it really is a two way street. And that's something that I want to make sure that people really understand when they're going down that road. It's not just your pitching and then people are either accepting your, your pitch or not. It's, it is a dance that you're doing. And it's really important that you feel good about the people you're talking to, too, because they are very different. So it was, there were definitely a lot of no's on the initial pitch, and there was also, a lot of interest um, and a lot of uh, extended conversations that either they or we chose sometimes not to pursue. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because I think there's this perception, like you hear about like, oh, such and such team of like 
ex riot devs or ex blizzard devs like get a whole bunch of like a heap of money just like given to them um that was not your experience right no i mean something brian and i talked about very early on is as a team of color mm -hmm. as founders of color you got to kind of work twice as hard for half as much um and that was definitely our experience um we saw people getting funding with napkin designs right and you know we couldn't get anywhere close to those sorts of conversations for a very long period of time. Um, it took years and years of perseverance and running through all of our money and, you know, uh, a lot of different, like, you know, har hardships along the way to kind of get to a point where we finally were able to secure, a, a, you know, a bag of money and, and be able to get the thing funded. Right. Um, so in terms of... Uh, I mean, I guess I, I want to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, now you are in a good place where you're, like, able to scale and grow, et cetera. Um, you know, you can see from your Twitter, you're doing a lot of hiring. Um, what are, like, what is that like? Can you speak to some of the challenges um, as, you're, as you're doing that? Because, you know, you, you went for a long time where it was, like, the, the four of you, effectively. Um, and then suddenly, uh, I think you said you've grown to, like, what, like 30-plus people? 30, if, well, if we, so we, we count Jess and Evan who works with us on the, on the narrative. Oh yeah, Evan well. Narcisse. So yeah. including um, Former Game Center adjunct. 37 currently. Okay, 37. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, you've sort of, you sort of say in your mission statement um, is, uh, you know, it's not about just kind of changing representation in terms of like characters, right? It's also about making a place in the industry for diverse folks. Um, like, how are you going about kind of the hiring process and, like, what, what is that like as you're trying to find kind of diverse talent? What are the ways that you see, like, the traditional industry kind of falling down on doing that? Um, and what are you doing to sort of rectify that? You know, you know when you say, uh, if you build it, they will come? We built it and they came. So, right. quite honestly, when you say this is what we are here to do and this matters to us and this is who we are, people who are there to try and build that as well find you. And we've been incredibly lucky with the phenomenal talent that we found. And I know everyone says, oh, our team is amazing. No, our team is amazing. Like, yeah. they are really incredible. And the, it, it is by far the most diverse workplace that, uh, workplace, not just games, but the most diverse workplace that I've ever worked at and that any of us have ever worked at. Um, and it feels really good because we all came together with a purpose and with a, a vision of creating the space that we hadn't seen before and we hadn't been a part of. So. Um, I think the biggest thing is really just that we've learned through this, and both Rashad and I are, oh, that's louder. Both Rashad and I are, are both uh, quieter. We're a little more show and prove, and Munvir is really the mouthpiece out of the three of us. Um, Justin kind of speaks through his work as well, so he's, he's more sort of on our side of, of humble, I think, uh, in some ways. Oh, wow, I'm not humble. <laughs> <laughs> You're not humble, no, but that's what I'm going to say. I've, I've learned from Munvir that putting it out there and saying what you are there to do is worth its weight in gold because people need to hear it. So doing that has enabled us to hire. And quite honestly, the, the most insane blessing, as much as COVID has been a huge challenge, the blessing that it has given us is that we're all working from home and that enabled us to look at people even further afield. So we're based in New York. We have a wholly owned subsidiary in Canada based out of Montreal, but we've been able to build a much more distributed team because we're building in this time when everyone is working from home. So we've got people all over. And I mean, all we have at last count 14 states and provinces represented on our team. And with that said, this feels like the tightest team of people I've ever worked on. And we're all in different places. If I could add on to that, one key thing that we did early was we talked to Andy McNamara, who is the former editor-in-chief at Game Informer, um, and we got a like three or four page story in one of their print magazines. It was like the same issue as like the big blizzard issue that year. Um, and that basically kind of told people who we were. We saw our social media engagement go up. A lot of people started following us, got a lot of just randoms saying, hey, I'm just really looking forward to knowing what you work on down the road. I'm so glad this exists. And like, Using that way of announcing the studio in such like the largest video game, English speaking video game magazine to my knowledge, um, was just a great way to spread our ethos kind of out there. And we talked a little bit about Corner Rules, which was the, what we were trying to get funded at, the, at that moment. Um, and that, that got a lot of attention for us. And so there's a lot of people who have interviewed with us and subsequently we've been hired. And some of them 
our audio director, Caleb, being one of them, um, basically have been like day one fans and kind of like came to us and like hounded us and was like, hey, are you ready to hire yet? Because like I want to come talk to you guys. Like this, this sounds amazing. Um, and that's been wonderful. I was just going to say, like, I know in some examples, some of the guys, people that you told to, in terms of what's happening now, that wasn't even on the table right. back when, you know, back when uh, the, those conversations started. It, a lot of it was just really off of the mission statement. Like, well, wait a minute. Like, I've never really been properly represented at my company, or, or I've never been properly represented in the products that my company has made. I've never seen myself in them. And I feel like you guys putting yourself out there and using that. Um, as your the 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 pole the the flagpole that you planted, if that makes sense, um, really is kind of what brought a lot of attention to it more so than you know the the, the title that you guys were kind of actively pitching at the time it was like oh wait these are people this this could be a made for us by us kind of thing which has been has been largely missing in this industry um, for the past forty years. That's a hundred percent true and. I've read through a lot of resumes. We've read through a lot of resumes throughout this process as we've been growing. And one of the most amazing things and, and one of the things that gives us our biggest sense of purpose is that people are applying and showing up as their whole, their whole selves. So they're writing us you know, cover letters that don't just say, hey, I have X number of years in the, in, in the industry. I'm good at these things. They're showing up and saying, this is who I am and this is why this matters to me. And it makes it, it, it reinforces our sense of purpose every day. Yeah, and, you know, I recognize some of that as well. So, you know, the additional hat I wear in addition to being um, a member of faculty here is um, being a co-founder and CEO of Glow Up Games, which is a mobile company with a very similar mission. And certainly, like, when we're interviewing people, um, we, you know, we interview a lot of, um, a lot of people from, you know, very diverse backgrounds. Um, and, like... Often people use that interview process as a sort of way to kind of just talk about industry trauma, right? Like, I don't know if that's something that you guys have also said. Uh, it's like, well, finally, here's like someone that will get it, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, we talk about trauma a lot at work, to be honest, because we all come in with our own different baggage, I think, from our previous workplaces and life experiences, and they can affect the, the team dynamic. And so we find ourselves... I, I'm sure you agree, like, I find myself being part therapist sometimes for some of the staff and, like, talking through, like, hey, I know that used to happen at this other workplace, so you don't have to come with that culture of fear here, and, you know, here's why. Um, and it's really amazing because we have such a talented, like, empathetic leadership team that doesn't just, like, point fingers and blame, which is every leadership team I've ever seen in this industry is, like, pointing figures or pointing fingers. I won't say every, but... I hear, for me, for me, it has definitely been. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> now you know why I had an intense distrust of producers and other yeah. man, <laughs> other authority figures. That's not our production team, though, because our production team is amazing. No, our production team is amazing, and so all of us, including myself, got to kind of start to deconstruct what a better workplace could be together and support each other and show through action that that we can make something bigger and better um, and a more in a more positive sense. So on that note, I mean. Obviously, it's a big topic of conversation right now. Like, we're having these conversations about, like, toxicity in the industry. And I know for a lot of people who are looking to get into the industry, and certainly for a lot of our students here who are, like, looking for, uh, for jobs, et cetera, that is a sort of anxiety that a lot of people have. Like, oh, my gosh, like, I'm hearing about all this stuff. Um, what would you, uh, like, what would you say to somebody in that position? Because I think, firstly, the fact that you you're all doing it, like you're trying to set up a, a place where that doesn't, um, that isn't the case. Um, Bryna, like how does your specific experience as a producer help you sort of think about that? Like how do we make kinder production environments? This, this industry has grown so much since I started in it, but it still has so much work to do. It's, uh, I, I started, you know, over 20 years ago and Quite honestly, we everyone was children, right? And all of the things that come along with that, um, and all of the mistakes that come along with that, and uh, there, there has been a lot of growth, but not enough. And there is so much further to go. I it really, it it breaks my spirit so much when I see people come, you know, fresh faced out of school and then go into an environment and have a really terrible experience because I don't want that for them. I want them to go out and have their first experience be something that makes them want to continue to do this because 
Games is, on the one hand, filled with some of the most creative, incredible people I've ever worked with. And on the other hand, also is filled with, you know, levels of toxicity and bias and all of the, and racism and all of the things that we deal with and sexism and like all of it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, we have like in, in game development, we talk about legacy code and a lot of um, our, our um, DNA as an industry is built on legacy code. And it's really hard to dig down and break that up and actually, you know, build something new. And that's why we did this is because we wanted to actually create it from the, from the ground up and actually do something that felt like the place that we've been looking for. It's um, on the production side, we, we have an incredible production team and they, and I'm, I'm, I keep saying they because I'm running the company, so I'm, I'm head of production, but our lead producer, Yesenia Cisneros is incredible. Um, our art producer, Justine Long is incredible. Our associate producer, Yasmin Leclerc is incredible. We have a phenomenal um, team and all of them are really technically sound, but they're also incredibly high in terms of empathy. And for me, on the production side, having that balance of being able to understand how the human element plays into what you are managing makes all of the difference because you can look at a burn down chart all day and you can see you know, what your team's velocity looks like, but you aren't necessarily seeing what that toll is taking on them and, and uh, where their limits are. So if you have a balance of being able to be technically good but also have a high level of empathy, you're much better able to actually understand how to manage a team in a way that is not going to burn them out and destroy them. Um, and it's also making sure that you are constantly reminding people that the grace that they give to others, they also have to give to themselves. Because every one of us is a high performer. And on our team, that is even more so. I think everyone is constantly trying to show improve. And what that means is they will show improve sometimes to their own detriment. So we have to constantly on the production side say, hey, do you have enough time to get that done? Do you need a little more grace for yourself? And, and that is like a constant check and balance that we do. Um. And you know, no doubt, when you have uh, when you're building a team of like largely underrepresented developers, um, that's extra important to think about, right? What is the? I think um, uh, you've you've maybe publicly or not said like what is the breakdown in terms of um, like what does the diversity of your company look like? Uh, we're phenomenally diverse. So um, out of that 37 people, because we do keep numbers on all this stuff, um, it, it, we are 42 percent. Female. We are not quite at gender parity yet. We don't have non-binary folks represented yet. However, I think that might might change. So we'll see shortly. Um, but uh, we are still those those numbers are much better than anything I've ever seen um, in terms of actual diversity. Once you put, I'm trying to remember exactly what I think we are at. 69 or 72 percent now um, people who identify as people of color on our team. Um, when you put the two numbers together, because everyone always wants to know is, you know, what's the quote unquote diverse number, although, but so if you put all that together, basically our team is 22% white male, which means we're 78% everything else. Um, so on that note as well, um, you know, I already asked about like, you know, you're, you're trying to, um, make sure that your team represents the kind of, um, you know, represents the kind of diversity in, in your games as well, and the kind of, um, you know, the, uh, the, the change that you want to see in games themselves. Um, when it comes to thinking about, like, the actual creative process, um, like, what are some things that you're, like, what does a sort of, like, what does a meeting at Brass Lion look like? Like, in terms of how you make sure that uh, everybody kind of, gets to say, like, you know, making sure that the right stakeholders are there, like, what does that look like? It, there's a lot of jokes and uh, bad puns from the dads in the group mm -hmm. uh, that, that starts off. Um, also, I'll just say real fast that it's amazing what you can do when you don't have to deal with microaggressions every day, like the power that you can use in meetings and for, in, the, in the product itself when you don't have to manage there's microaggressions every day, so that's also something that helps. But a meeting, I mean, usually there's a good chunk of the team because we are distributed and, and you know, in COVID times we are all working from home. Um, there's usually a good chunk of the team in a meeting. Um, and, you know, usually we have one of the producers kind of kicks it off um, and we go towards our purposes. Everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, we use Zoom a lot, so there's always a side chat that's usually half jokes and silliness. 
but sometimes actual real questions are coming up there too. And it gives people a chance to kind of asynchronously, you know, ask something without interrupting something, a point that someone's making. Um, but one of the key things that we really try to do is empower the team itself to run more autonomously. So like, um, you know, I'm kind of, I started off kind of doing double duty as both the co-game director with Rashad, but also the design director originally. And with the design team, um, I never sat there and said, you have to do it this way. It has to be like this. I set a framework. I set a, an overall like scaffolding, and then they started filling it in and running with things. And then we got um, an amazing design director to join, Ken Hudson, and he's continued that sort of process of, of letting the, the group solve their problems autonomously. Um, and we've gotten commended for that, that we're not like hand-holding or forcing decisions and that you know, we're there to correct things and set certain things. And there's certain things that I'm like, it needs to be this way. And I'll speak up on that. But I, that, that process has been very empowering for the entirety of the team. And I think it would be empowering for any team, no matter what their diverse makeup would be. Right. There's also really basic um, sort of social cues that you can use. Like, hey, in, in, on a Zoom call, you have the ability to raise your hand. If we have things that we want to ask about or, or mention or discuss, we all raise our hands. Every one of us will raise our hands on that call. Um, and we, that helps us make sure that we're making sure everyone is heard. It, it seems really basic, but things like that, I think, get overlooked a lot. Um, and I want to, like, so just, um, you're obviously involved in kind of, you're involved in, like, both the projects that Brass Lion uh, are doing right now. So what does, um, like, you know, it, and the fact that you're integrated into, into the project, like, very early on, like, mm -hmm. what does, um, which, you know, I, I think that's, that's kind of amazing that you're mm -hmm. able to sort of have that kind of creative input. Um, how is that, do, does that sort of differ from other game projects it you've worked on? It definitely does. Okay. So one of the things that I want to say I'm just going back to what they were saying about their meetings and whatnot and how everything is positioned. Um, you know, it actually reminds me of some of my time at Rockefeller, where there was clearly a hierarchy, but it didn't operate like a dictatorship, if that made sense. Where it was like nobody was looking over my neck, you know, or over my, over, you know, over my shoulder rather, you know, checking to see what I was doing, you know. Nobody's over Guru's shoulder like, yo, how is this mix coming along? Everybody, we all knew why we were there. We knew what our strengths were. We knew what our weaknesses were. And we, and we made that work together. And I see a lot of synergy in that in terms of the approach to the, uh, excuse, excuse me, the leadership and execution at Brass Line, you know, which for me is a good omen. In terms of me being in very early on, yes, it is a very big difference because in some of the uh, situations that I've, or some of the projects that I've been brought in on, um, kind of almost from the beginning, you know, there was always two things. It was always, uh, we want credibility, and we want you to fix anything that we might have gotten wrong, right? Um, and my thing was, well, how did you get this far and get it wrong? You know, you, you've been in development for three years, and now you want to clean it up in the last two months. You know, so the fact that we can all put our heads together from the jump, you know, and in some cases, I'm the Obi-Wan. In some cases, I'm the learner. You know, and, um, and that's all, what's also great about it, you know, is it's like there's a certain amount of respect for me there because of everything that I've done and who I am. But at the same time, they all know that I am I have no problem with just sitting back. Like sometimes we're in meetings and they're like, Just what's up? And I'm like, nothing, just soaking in the game. You know, like no pun intended. Like I'm just, I'm just, there's certain parts of this process that I, that I would never profess to be a, an expert on. There are other times where I'm like, nope, no, that wouldn't happen. You can't do this. You can't do that. You got to fix this. You know, and everybody's respectful of everybody's expertise. And that's why I said it kind of reminds me of my previous tenure where we kind of did the same thing with each other. You know, um, if, if, if I was an expert in a certain field, they let me be. If somebody, if somebody else was, uh, you know, was ahead of their, ahead of their game or ahead of the, uh, on top of their game, rather, in that particular field, we let them do what they do. You know, and... Um, I think that's the greatest thing about this experience for me is everybody knows their role, they get in where they fit in, and we're, we're making it work. And yeah, I'm just happy to be there early so there's less mess to potentially have to clean up uh, later. And, and to give Just all the credit, like there's design decisions that have come from ideas that he threw out. There was like a time we had a text chain on like a Sunday, and I was just like, yo, I got this idea, and I just texted it to you, and we ended up on like a 30, 40 minute call, and like on that Monday, I was like, all right, I'm putting this stuff in the game, like. Look, I, I never knew how to use PowerPoint before. Right? <laughs> so like, he hits me, he's like, yo, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, all right, hold on. 
So I start typing it in my phone, like in my notes, how I normally do. Because like when we're making records, right, we'll just send each other notes. Like, turn the bass down here, do this, do that. Matter of fact, this record should feel like this. And when that vocal happens, do this. And then, but I'm like, wait a minute, I, I, I need visuals, I need videos to support my opinion. So next thing I know, I'm in a PowerPoint, like an hour later, like making a full-on deck. And I'm like, how did I get here? <laughs> You know, but some of those notes ended up being super effective for things that we needed in the game later on. You know, so it's, again, we're all pushing each other to do things that might be a little bit out of our comfort zone, but are all for the greater good. And I will go, to use the last analogy, um, going back to, you know, the Rockefeller situation, one of the things that Jay always used to say uh, when, we would, when we would have heads butting in the room, his thing was always, you'll put all that to the side, what's the best for the record? You know, like forget me, forget who, forget the producer, forget the engineer, whatever. Whoever's in this room right now, if you're in this room, that's because your opinion matters. What's the best thing for the record? And we're doing what the what the best thing is for the game. That's amazing, and yeah, I mean the fact that you are so involved closely. I'm also just like secretly wondering, like, just Blaze, do you use Jira? Are you in Jira? <laughs> Am I what? <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. No, no, um, he is not. <laughs> um, Okay. Oh, task tracker. <laughs> I've tried, I try and keep up with Slack as best as I can. Um, I've tried, what's the other one um, that we've tried like two or three times with the, with the note, with the sticky notes? Oh, um, uh, Miro. Yes, no, not Miro, no, the other one. Trello? Trello, I've tried Trello. Just Blaze says no to Miro, yes to Trello. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, no, that, that's incredible. Um, so, um, do you, are you sort of working with, so, you know, you're doing sort of like music composition and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and all of that is game design as well, right? Like, that's right. the thing. Like, ultimately, all of these things end up contributing to the, like, final... Like, well, to the overall experience. I mean, here's the thing is, it's like, oh, I've done this before with other game companies, right? But it's, it was never for us. You know, like, I remember, like, just hanging out, like, because, like, for example, when I was doing NBA Street 2, like, I did more than just the music. It was, you know, certain audio cues or things that should happen on screen when this song is playing or, like, oh, your, your menu sounds suck. Let me do them over. You know what I mean? It wasn't what I was brought in for. I was just trying to bring more authenticity to what they were doing because I cared. You know what I mean? Which I don't regret doing. It was like, Street 2 is, is considered uh, uh, one of the best, if not the best, street ball game of all time. Um, but it's, it hits different when you're doing it for yourself and for your people. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I've, I've actually traded some other things in the world for it mm -hmm. and, and put a few things on hold because this was more important to me. That's, that's amazing. I will say this, too. When we initially, he was just, like we, he said, he was always our uninitial fourth, right? Unofficial fourth. And it was, well, what do we call him? He, I mean, he's him. Right? He doesn't really need an introduction most of the time. But eventually we were like, all right, we actually need a proper title. Like if you had a business card, what would your business card be? Not that he'll ever give anyone a business card. Um, and so you, now you want a business card? All right. So we settled on director of music and culture. And that was intentional because it's not just music. He really is, like he said, fact checking. He's like making sure that, that things are authentic and correct and real whenever they need to be. He has a say in what we're doing that goes much beyond the music. And I think on that note as well, um, we are sort of in this era where, um, you know, we're talking about, like, you know, we're talking about, like, representation matters, et cetera, but what that has often resulted in, and I think this is true of, like, games, film, and TV, where there are a lot of white folks writing, writing characters of color, right? Like, it's um, that kind of surface level representation or folks like trying to um, be like, well, you know, we should have a, we should have a diverse character. And uh, so what, um, yeah, I just want to like put that out there. Like Manvir, I want to ask you about your, your take on that and like what, um, yeah, just want to, we'll throw that to you. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that there's lots of people from different backgrounds that are trying, mm -hmm. but I think lived experiences and growing up in certain communities um, cannot be replaced. And, and there's a certain authenticity that comes from that. So, for example, Corner Wolves eventually became this like eight episode narrative podcast that's gonna be coming out in the near future. Um, and we brought on um, a black writer, Evan Narcisse, formerly worked at Kotaku, IO9, 
He's written on Marvel's like Black Panther comics and done some amazing other work. Worked on the Miles Morales game that just came out. And you know, for me, it was important to Evans from New York. I'm not from New York. I'm from the D.C. area. Uh, Evans, black from New York. I'm I'm a South Asian kid. I'm I'm Punjabi. You know, and so I wanted to make sure that we had a voice you know, that was able to speak to some of the authenticity, both the era, the language, the, um, and the way the city was in the, in the 90s, because I was a teenager in those years, and I wasn't coming up to New York just quite yet in the era that, like, the, the show is set in. Um, and so Evan coming on board, and Evan's also working on our game project now as well, because we have such a good time working with him. Um, I don't think I could ever replicate the quality of work with the best white male writer in that room because there's just a there's just a sense of knowledge that's like innate that's built in that he has that's helpful and, and just is the same way there's times where just has been able to correct language like nope that that slang word wasn't used in 94 that didn't come into like the late 90s and it's like oh okay my bad like I forgot um you know or I didn't really re remember when it started I just remember using that as a kid um and so those lived experiences, I think, are more valuable to us and to me. Mm -hmm. And then, frankly, for us as a team centering this, we, we got to go out of our way to make sure that the kind of characters that were in our game are being represented by the people in the writer's room. And this is a problem I had at Bioware, which was a very white writer's room. And I was not in that writer's room personally. I was a game designer, not a narrative designer. Um, and there's a lot of really talented writers there, and I like a lot of people there. But, like, that stuff showed when there's like very generic black characters written who have daddy issues and it's like the same old trope for the 400 millionth time. And, and getting away from that was something that like re really mattered to us. And, and that's, that was the, the, the power of hiring someone like Evan. Yeah, um, and I just want to say really quickly, um, anyone in the room, if you want to ask a question, make sure you're like writing it down. We'll take a little break in a second to, uh, to pass those along. But. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I was gonna ask you about kind of how, how folks go about like, um, you know, enacting that sort of systemic change, but you've given this, this sort of like microcosm example of how you're doing it, a brass lion, right? Which is, surprisingly enough, bring in folks who have the experience. Um, but to, you know, if there is, uh, you know, if there are folks out there who are wanting to, um, you know, write characters or write or, you know, make, games representing um, an experience that they perhaps don't necessarily have or whatever, like what would you say um, they should be doing? Like what's the... Oh gosh, um, there's so many, I mean, it's, it's tough, right? It's really tough. And there are a lot of different um, avenues that you can go. If you're, again, if you're talking straight out of school, um, there is a couple different things you can do. You can uh, do something on your own. There are a lot of incredible indie teams and, and individuals out there, quite honestly, making their dream project because that's the only way they can get it done. Um, and so that's one avenue that is always available is to really just go out and do it on your own. Um, getting funding, as we mentioned, is tough. I'm not gonna lie. If you're looking to do something um, out of the gate and, and really have someone else pay for it, there are a lot of different ways to do it. It is not necessarily an easy road. Um, and it is also tough as a new person on a team to bring your idea forward and have it made because everyone has ideas, producers have ideas. I mean, we all have stuff that we would love to make given the right scenario. Um, what I will say is that I think something that I've noticed from watching Justin Music is you always watch him, I'm gonna paraphrase you, but you always watch him talk to young artists and he'll say, create a movement on your own and people will start to pay attention. And I think that also translates in games, quite honestly. If you can start to do something on your own and you start to get a bit of traction behind it and you get some visibility on it, that can go a really long way. So that's, quite honestly, the best sort of fastest way to create what you want to create and really have that impact is to start to do it um, w whether someone is paying you for it or not. That doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah, and if you don't have the, like if you're in a writing room or something along those lines and you don't have the actual experience to write the kind of characters that you're writing, at minimum, you should be asking yourself two things, I think. One is, should I be doing this? Is this the right thing to be doing? Is this my story to tell? And if you think it is, I want you to really ask yourself that question hard um, and, and ask yourself it a few times and, and have a good answer for that. And then if you get past that question, is then t take it to folks that are from these communities, whatever, whoever you're representing, whatever group other group that you're representing that, that you're not from. Like, 
make sure you're including their voices in the feedback loop and listen to them, not just, you know, oh, well, I passed it around and like two black guys said, yeah, it's good, so it's good, right? Like no, you can't just do it like that. Um, like you, you need to actually come with a, a, a certain amount of thought. And that's why it's so important to ask yourself, is this the right story for me? Or, you know, is this the thing that I need to be telling? Yeah. Oh, on the flip side of that, I mean, you could be making a game about aliens, right? You can't just go ask the aliens if it's accurate. Just make sure that it's something that you love, something that, it's pa that you're passionate about, something that you're willing to do a deep dive in. If you're going to, you know, um, I, I achieved what some would call greatness within my culture because I studied what came before me, right? Whatever it is you're trying to make, whether it's a first-person shooter, whether it's a game based in World War II, whether it's the next, I don't know, what was a silly game? Cuphead, whatever. Whatever it is, just study the history of that and what made the games that came before uh, what you're trying to make in that same lane great. Great, study what made them great. You know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, again, that, that, that applies, I think that applies in anything in life in general. If you're trying to build something, study what came before what you're trying to do. In any lane that in any lane that you're trying to fall into, because chances are anything that you're trying to do, 99% has been somehow done somewhat already, right? So how do you top it? How do you do it better? How do you offer a new twist on that? Or the off chance that you do find a new lane that hasn't been tapped somehow, um, do the knowledge on whatever circumstances are surrounding whatever it is you're trying to present. But there's always something to uh, to study, you know. Um, I guess, you know, me as a producer, I'm on, I don't know, 22-ish years now in this game. The average rap producer gets three, four, or five. Um, there's a handful of us. There's maybe less than 15 or 20 that can say we've been able to do that for that long. I can tell you right now, the one common thread amongst all of us is that before we were producing music, we were DJing. And when we were DJing, we were studying all the music that came before our time. You know, we were able to apply that to the work that we do now. Um, and I think the same goes for anything that you're doing creatively. So just you know, do the knowledge and um, don't be afraid to go back in order to figure out how to move forward. And from a, from a pitch perspective, there's a couple of things that um, anyone who really knows, not even just necessarily publishers, but investors who know games are looking for. Their first is to try and reduce risk. So they're looking for, um, are you gonna make it or are you gonna fail at what you're trying to do? So does your team know how to work together that reduces your risk if you've already you know, worked on something before? Is what you are doing something that is established and exists in some form? Like are you trying to do something that is completely out of the box or something that has you know, some fundamental principles that have been proven out previously? But then once they reduce the risk, they wanna know what's different about it. So what are you doing that differentiates what you're doing what sets it apart, what's actually unique and interesting. And it's walking a really fine line between what makes it safe and what makes it um, shiny and new. Um, so it sounds like, you know, obviously know your craft, like know um, what you're making, know the history, um, ask yourselves questions about like what story are you telling and why. Um, and then also, um, yeah, like find, uh, sort of if you're if you're putting that out there to kind of pitch what is the thing that's like new in in the way and you know having studied what came before have you know you're not just reinventing everything at once um so um i want to um uh take a little break while we just uh while we just sort of gather the questions in the room um so everyone just like take a minute to stretch your legs etc and we will reconvene We kept it going though. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, OK, so uh, before we continue into part two, I'm going to take a moment to thank our sponsors for the, for the NYU Game Center lecture series. So um, that is Fresh Planet, Take Two Interactive, Dots, and Empire State Development. So thank you to our sponsors. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions uh, in the room um, for, for all of you. Um, so, uh, Beta, do you want to go ahead and start with your question? So I have a question to Minvir. Um, uh, looking at your track record within the industry, it's amazingly impressive. Uh, you mentioned that um, after receiving your degree in CompSci, uh, you made it into the industry as a gameplay programmer, then you worked yourself up to the combat designer position. Uh, I've been planning my whole life to get into this field. It's been a challenge as, as I struggle with the ability to communicate my vision effectively with the programming team. And it's also been overwhelming for me as an uh, Arab stepping into the industry. Um, I'm fairly good at programming, uh, but my workflow differs completely from those around me. So uh, for you, as a person who worked um, in this uh, field, um, uh, what were your responsibilities when it came to communicating with various team members of different roles, and how much emphasis was placed on your role uh, from a programming perspective? Uh, additionally, what would you tell your younger self when it came to the combat design position that you had? Sure. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, so for me, a lot of the time when you're working as a combat designer, you're working in what we would call like a strike team. And that strike team is usually a cross-functional team made up of like animators and programmers and a uh, sound person and artists uh, and other, other designers potentially. Um, and so you're kind of working as a group, but a lot of the times the designer is kind of the glue tying a lot of the different pieces together. And so a lot of the time, at least in my, the workplaces I've been in, the designer is like looked towards at being the leader of that group. And so I've kind of been that informal leader. I've also been a, like a lead formally uh, before this, but like also just in an informal way, you know, on Mass Effect and things like that, would like run a strike team and like help direct this portion of the game so that the lead designer didn't have to worry about that. And it's like, you know, I got this handled. Let me make these calls and I'll fill you in and you give me any high level feedback that needs to change. So with that, you do need to find a commonality and a, a both a language to use and a process that works for everybody. And that might not be the most optimal for you. Um, I'm neurodivergent, so sometimes I, the way things process in my head are not the same way that other folks process things. Um, and what's best for me isn't best for the programming team. And, and so sometimes I've gotten very frustrated and I've had to grow and learn how to do, handle like those difficult times a lot better by, by fitting into a process that didn't always like work necessarily for me, it didn't make sense. An example would be, frankly, producers sometimes asking, how long is this thing gonna take? And I go, how the fuck do I know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I haven't done it yet. <laughs> um, um, but like, we gotta make a schedule and we gotta make our best guesses and you gotta like learn how to start estimating tasks and, and work that way. And so, um, First off, being around an environment that where each person respects each other is important because then you know everyone's coming at it with um, good intentions and you can like you know there's not malice there and you know uh, hopefully you know there's not malice there. If you're in that environment, you've got a whole different set of problems that this is not applied for. Um, and then for me, because I was an ex-programmer, <laughs> I could call bullshit sometimes when I needed to. I could be like, no, actually I know how to implement this and you would do X, Y, and Z, or this is the high level algorithm, or this is the general way you would implement it. And uh, like either sh show a different way to implement it to the coders, or frankly, I've, I've had a couple engineers who were trying to, you know, no, oh, no, you can't do that because they didn't want to do that work. And I've had to call them out on it. I was like, no, this is doable. And here's how we would do it. And got them to realize that my, those technical skills that I have help inform the designs I make. So all of my technical background, I, like I don't code anymore. I don't look at code anymore. Thank God, too, I would be terrible at it. But like my technical background informs everything that I do because I can think about what the system and the code looks like in the back end while I'm designing, like the front end. And now I'm at a very, you know, I'm a co-creative director, so a co-game director. And so now I'm able to basically like still think very high level, but still 
think about what's the system look like? How does that interact with this next system? How do these things work together? How is that going to affect this combat? How is that going to affect you know, this reward loop that the player has? Um, and so um, what I've just found in general has been trying to use my technical skills um, in a positive way, try to always use positive uh, reinforcement and leadership skills that I've learned throughout my career. Um, and even in my youth, my, you know, it was really important to my father that like, I learned leadership skills at a young age. I'm very thankful for that. You know, I hated it when I was a kid, but it was really important as a, an adult now. Um, and using those things in, as a force for good. And when things do go rough, again, trying to mentor or find out what the problem is, trying to solve some of the people problems and, and getting in and being willing to do that and doing it in a empathetic sort of way. So I'm not sure if that fully answers your question. Oh, okay. Can I add something to that too from a hiring perspective? Be upfront about what you want to do because even if you may not get to do it right away, uh, your combination of skills and your way of thinking in the right environment will be a plus. Right? So we have people on our team who've done multiple roles, like um, Shadi Devenji, who is uh, incre an incredibly talented um, Unreal expert who is a, I worked with him years ago on Sleeping Dogs when he was a technical designer who had a comp sci background. So he became a programmer, went back to school to become a game designer, started working as a technical designer, and ended up going back to being a dev and a, a programmer. He's incredibly talented because he's done both roles and he understands the way designers think. So he can build tools and stuff for them because he knows what they need. So in the right environment, your way of thinking will be helpful. So don't, don't lose the heart for it. Um, I want to ask you as well, Bryna, like as a, um, as a producer and previously, you know, you, as you said, when you worked at EA, EA has like creative producers, which are more like, you know, game designers, right? Um, which is a specific like EA type thing. Um, I just want to, you know, how, how often in your career have you like stepped outside of your sort of direct discipline of like production? Like what is your relationship to sort of understanding um, like, I don't know, like code, like stuff like that? I never wanted to be the producer who was trying to do another role and not trying to, to facilitate the people who were experts in their areas. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I didn't want to learn as much as possible about it, but I have respect for that, right? I think if you've learned your craft, I have respect for what you've learned. And I think as a producer, it's really important to trust your experts. Mm -hmm. So the best producers figure out how to ask the right questions. And you might already have an idea once you're experienced of where they're gonna go once you ask those questions, but you don't go there for them and you don't step on their toes. Because once you do that, you're taking the power away from the, the people who've learned that, that talent and that that expertise they've gained. So it's really important to continue to have respect for your team and not just step on their toes and tell them this is how it's gonna be. You can put parameters in place, right? And say, hey, I, I know you wanna do this and I understand why. This is the realities of you know, space and time and this is what we have to do. So we're gonna to have to make a tough call. Let's, let's talk about it. But you, if you lose respect for them, people stop um, feeling invested in what they're building because they don't have ownership of it. Um, and just, I kind of want to throw a similar question to you as well, because um, obviously you've already talked about your kind of, um, you know, it sounds like you have absorbed a lot about like game design and about kind of working on games. Um, and you seem to have this like natural curiosity about like learning other disciplines, like to your like direct work as a, as a music producer, um, how have you like, what, what are times you've stepped outside of kind of doing like music production and... You know, I went to school for uh, computer science and programming. Okay. I, I coded my first game when there I was in. Go. I coded my first game when I was in fourth grade. Um, many years ago, it was a very different world back then. Um, but uh, yeah, so for me, it's just kind of like cool to just to watch the evolution as somebody who was programming lightly, you know, as a kid in that Commodore, Atari era, um, you know, and then kind of all the way up until you know when I stopped when Flash was like the new thing. <laughs> when, it, when, when Adobe didn't even own it yet, I think it was Macromedia yeah. owned it at first. They actually had the launch party downstairs from my studio, like on Broadway in the city. Like, and I'm like, what's this about? They're like, this new thing called Macromedia Flash. It's gonna be the next big thing. You wanna come down and learn it? And I was like, sure, all right, cool. You know, so like that was the end of, for, of it for me. So you figure that's 96, 97 ish, or something like that. Well, now it's okay because Flash is dead. And yes, it is. is. <laughs> um, but yeah, the kind of, you know, like, but just having that little bit of, you know, once, once you have the knowledge that the logic never leaves you, 
right? Like even if the language changes, the, the logic doesn't leave. So just sitting with the guys who are, who are working with us now and implementing all the ideas that we have now and, you know, whereas like when I was working with EA, for example, you know, 15, 20 years ago and saying, hey, maybe we should try this. All right, we'll get back to you in a week. You know, then they, had, they would have to like physically mail me like a, a, an alpha disc to put in the, the test PS2 or GameCube or whatever to like now it's like, oh, hey guys, we should try this. All right, hold on, done upload it into the Unreal test thing and we're, and we're rocking, you know what I mean? Um, it's great, I'm, I'm happy that um, I fell into this when I did because the technology, I say the same thing about music, the technology can keep up with the ideas now. Right. You know, whereas you can just think of something and try it in two seconds and if it works, it works and you stick with it. If it doesn't, you, you move Yeah, on. like that, that feedback loop is like so much shorter. Yeah, it's much, much smaller now, it's much smaller. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, let's go back to audience questions. Uh, Matty, you had a question. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for showing up and being present. I appreciate it. Um, so a lot of our grad students have been interested in um, kind of like thinking about labor practices and about kind of like, you know, it's now especially like this year is not uncommon to hear about horrible stories from um, from uh, large and small companies. Um, and usually it comes out in the form of an expose. So it's kind of hard to know like, as kind of like to take out of your words and say like, how do we change things into like a positive force? Like what are the kind of um, labor like um, practices that have been handed down to you all? And like, what are the issues and creativity that you have to begin experimenting on? Like what are just hard problems? where you're like, okay, this has just been handed down to us from the legacy of like game production. And, you know, like, so they can begin experimenting and thinking about these things now. That'd be kind of cool. Oh, um, so there's so many things. Yeah. <laughs> um, unpacking trauma and helping to work through it as a team and actually being transparent about that and having those conversations in the open is a pretty big one for us. So it's not just something that happens behind closed doors. We actively talk about people's previous experiences and how that impacts you know, decisions and, and reactions that we all have today because everybody's been through different things. Um, so that's number one for us. Um, hiring someone whose job that is, is really important. So we have a, an incredible, um, I'm not gonna call her HR, she's um, talent and culture um, consultant by the name of Trinae Foreman who um, has known, so she actually came to us because she has known just since grammar school. Um, but she's accomplished in the HR field on her own. Um, but she's phenomenal. She's the right fit for us uh, as a team because she works with us and helps us to um, work through the previous trauma and also to put in place the structure that you need. Because when you're growing a, a team of a decent size, you know, from a startup perspective, you kind of, everyone wears a lot of hats. And you start to learn really pretty early on that for things like this, someone has to wear that hat and they need to keep it on because uh, everyone on the team needs someone that they can go to, to talk to, who is gonna be able to actually w work through some of that stuff with them, who's gonna be able to you know, advocate and, and help facilitate things that they need. Um, and quite honestly, because that structure is really important. So we've done things like we've, you know, we're, we're still new, we're a new studio. So all of our stuff is, is in its infancy, but we worked out of the gate to put in place, you know, a, a performance review process, which we're just rolling out now. Um, but it's it's a, the earliest version of it, but it's one that is rooted in positive reinforcement and also helping to make sure that it's a dialogue and not a one-way feedback loop. Because a lot of times what happens is people go into a performance review, they sit down and they get their feedback. And not a lot of conversation goes both ways. And that's not really helpful. So we're trying to turn that into something that's actually positive. Um, I know there's a lot of talk around organization in, in the games industry. We are, quite honestly, as a, a leadership team, all for it. I think you know there's there's nothing wrong with putting structure in place and putting limitations in place. And I think um, game development is an area where historically there has been a legacy of crunch and a legacy of you know overtime that is may or may not feel mandated, depending on the studio and the sort of overall vibe at the time. Um, and it, that can be really life altering and, and um, dangerous. So um, I, I'm, you know, we've all been through the ringer on various projects at various times, and we think it's really important that boundaries are set and people have the ability to, you know, live their lives outside of work. 
quite honestly. So um, whatever form that takes in terms of change that, that makes that possible in the industry, we think it's really important that people recognize that it can't continue at that pace. We're also coming at it from the perspective of grown-ups with you know, children and lives and you know, lived experience. I, I'm not, you know, my, my 22-year-old self was gonna work till 1 a.m. My 40-something-year-old self is not. You know. My 40-something-year-old self will work all night. And that's, but that's kind of the, the, the balance that we have to strike. So like, just to be completely clear, like, or honest, like there was that one time where you were in Slack and you were talking about how I had worked on something for like three days straight. And it was just, the end result of it was like this amazing thing that we put together, you know, but then, I, you know, Manveer and Rashad caught like, hey, you just said that he, you were kind of like celebrating the fact that he stayed up for three days straight. It's like, no, we're celebrating the end result, but, but it's just something that like, you have to be conscious of. Like, I, I stayed up for three days straight by choice because I'm a maniac and that's what I do. That's part of the reason why I ended up becoming successful as I did, because I did that. Just not to say that you have to do that. That's just, that was my choice. But you just have to be so careful in the way you even word things. Because it could, 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 that, a statement like that could very easily come off like you're endorsing, hey, don't sleep, work hard, bust your behind, you know, and, 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 and whatever, endure, relive whatever trauma you lived in the past, you know, um, so you, that is something to be, and I, I never thought about that before, like, because I used to say sometimes it's like, yo, I just stayed up for two days, but I knocked it out, look, this is amazing, look, and everybody's like, oh, it's great. But then after you put it to me that way, I'm like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. You know? it's, it's setting an example and like you said, changing the language, right? And also holding each other accountable. When I say, hey, this is, he did this amazing thing and he's barely slept for days doing it. And then Manveer and Rashad are like, so just thinking about what you just said, and I was like, you're 100% right. And made a point of telling the team, hey, I wanna be clear that we're celebrating the work how he chooses to get to that work because he is an anomaly. <laughs> he tends to work his own hours, um, not you know standard like team hours. He's he's coming in as himself and doing what works best for him. That's and what he's done is amazing. But we don't want anyone emulating that for the sake of doing it. It's really important not to do that because we have limitations as humans. Um, I've heard another um, game studio had. Uh, uh, refer to that, and they were they were quoting someone else. I don't know who sort of came up with this uh, as a as a concept or a turn of phrase, but um, refer like when you're going through that period of like, oh, I'm very like creatively inspired. I want to like I'm just going to keep working, um, uh, you know, long hours or whatever to get this thing done because I'm feeling inspired. Um, you know, you could, the thing that was uh, that this other this other studio does is uh, say like, oh, I'm I'm following the muse like I'm following my muse and like actually like speak to that and say like this is something that I'm doing um, because it makes sense for me right now. There is like, and that's not pressure on anyone else to kind of do the same thing, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's the same thing with, with, with records. There are times like, you know, a, a major turning point for us with one of our current projects um, was something, I, I saw some artwork that one of the, um, yeah, that I, I didn't want to say names. I didn't know. Yeah, so uh, Jesse, who's one of our amazing artists, um, presented presented some artwork during one of our Zoom meetings, and it inspired me so much that like I knocked out like ten pieces of music in like a night and a half, you know. And like you said, I was following my muse. Like it, I saw something and then I saw music, and then I heard it in my head after I saw it, and then I just went and did it, you know. Um, as creative, and I feel like that's the that's where it gets a little weird because creative people operate differently. You know, like people who operate when it comes to numbers and ones and zeros and whatever. Not to say that there can't be creativity in that, but those of us who just tend to create something out of nothing, like when we f we might not be able to do anything for three weeks, and then you find that inspiration, and all of a sudden, six months of work, six months worth of work will come out in three nights. You know, so there, there has to, there's, I don't think that's something that you can quantify. I think it's a case by case thing, you know. Um, in, our, in, in the line of, you know, in the business that I came from, it was just, our motto was you do whatever you have to do, whatever you have to do it. So that's always gonna be my approach. I mean, I've, I've been conditioned to do that. You know what I mean? And, I, and, I, and I'm happy to do that because one thing that I did learn is, I feel like if, for example, if you look at my, uh, my iPhone, you will see eight zillion voice notes because I will have, I'll be sitting in the car, I'll be 
out somewhere or whatever, and I hear, I hear a melody in my head or I hear a song idea in my head, I sing it into my voice notes with the intention of going home and being able to recapture that magic. I will tell you this, 90% of the time it doesn't work. If I don't sit down in front of a keyboard or in front of something that I can put this music out to within a, a few minutes, I'm going to lose that. I, I might still have the notes themselves, but the feeling that I had when those notes came to me, if that's not there, it doesn't project the same. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I say like there really is no standard, and that's where I really where I feel for you guys. You know what I mean? Because that's that's tough. Like, how do you tell people to to remain inspired, but don't kill yourself executing your inspiration? Part of what you have to do is is give people space to do that, which means not overburdening them, especially from like a production perspective. So if you need to go into a creative zone you kind of create a safe space for that, but it's also recognizing from a management perspective, when somebody goes into that and they, they push really hard for something and they feel they need to do that and you allow them the space to do that, afterwards recognize it and encourage them to then take some time, right? If that's how they need to work and they need to work in, you know, like ebb and flow or kind of like spurts like that, then make sure that they also take the downtime because you still have to actually recoup afterwards. Yeah, and I think... Um yeah, and that's where we run into issues with, with how games companies are set up traditionally, right? Where you're taking that like tendency that creative folks have to like, you know, just get stuff done, like often do what needs to be done, but then you're trying to scale that up to a company culture and that's where it gets really dicey, right? So um, we only have a few more minutes. I know I think we've got a question from the chat, which Naomi, our department chair, is gonna relay. Hey, I'm speaking is this on. Oh wait, I just have to speak over here. I'm, I'm uh, the, the voice of the Twitch chat. So this was a question from Squishy Mag. Uh, it's from Manvir about uh, technical practices in the industry. Um, Squishy Mag says, we're in the era of a boom of game creation software. Uh, and object-oriented coding varies on each platform. Yeah, Unity, Unreal, Game Maker. Uh, so being a game developer in the industry, have you found that there's any crossover between the various software used by game companies? Like, are there principles that individuals should learn in order to prepare for these environments where there's so many different tools being used? I think um, if you're doing some lot, like if you're trying to do some design work, having a base understanding of like logic, for me, it was learning C++, but you could learn like logic style coding through visual software, you could learn it through Unity, you could learn it through Unreal, um, other things. I think that's really important, understanding like what an and does, what an or does, how you would use these things, what a loop is, how you would use those sorts of structures to build something uh, is really important and will level you up really fast. Um, and you can do that with, the, I'm not familiar with Game Maker personally, like I've never worked with it, but um, Unity, Unreal, all the major kind of softwares and even all the private engines behind the scenes usually have some sort of layer for designers or an, and non-coding people to still express logic, or it could be writing Lua code sometimes, or Lua script, excuse me, um, stuff like that. So I think understanding those logical sorts of ways of thinking, Boolean logic, et cetera, um, is actually really important, um, because then, then you can start breaking down, well, here's the thing I'm trying to solve. I wanna make a boulder that bounces. Like, what are the things that I need to check? You know, how does that work? And then the other part is just understanding how software in a game works, understanding that you're running a simulation like potentially every 60th of a second. And what does that simulation include? Does it include networking, physics, rendering, um, the game logic, the AI, moving around the animation updates, uh, sound, positional stuff, all this other stuff. And when you can start thinking about the way that that's structured, then when you have a problem, you can start breaking it down into those component parts, and then you can think about, well, what's the logic that I need to use to make sure that if the boulder hits the ground, it bounces, and this is how much it bounces, and at what velocity, and oh, here are my old physics equations from a book that I found. You know, <laughs> this is what velocity looks like, and oh, that's not fun realistic, so what's the little fudge factor I should add in here to make it fun or interesting versus, you know, what, what's realistic, you know, for example. So those are some of the things that I would use to sort of approach that, that sort of problem. Um, all right, well, I think we're pretty much at time. So 
Um, I just want to say like a huge thank you to everybody for being here, and I think this this lineup has probably never happened before in this format, right? Like, um, so I want to appre and say you know just appreciate you all three of you being here, um, and to, to just for jumping in as well the last minute. Is there any um, so for folks who want to sort of follow Brass Lion, um, want to support your work? What's the best thing that they can do? Um, you can go to BrassLionEntertainment.com or you can follow us on social media at Brass Lion Ent. Um, we are hiring currently, so if you are in the industry looking for a job, we do have open positions that we've posted on our social media, LinkedIn, and things like that. What's your take on hiring interns? Um, we have not currently hired interns, but that is something we want to add into our practice. As we were starting the studio, it was important for us to start with more senior mm -hmm. folks to make sure that there was a good foundation of leadership. But now we've started to hire a lot more junior folks, and I think Next year, we'll probably have a discussion about internships and things like that. It will come. We think mentoring in this industry is really important, yeah. so it's something that it, it will come. But we had to get our, our foundational layer in place first so we could do it right. And paid internships, not unpaid internships, because that's just bullshit. Absolutely. I think that's illegal now. Go, well, that doesn't stop well. people. But, yeah. <laughs> like, I, that's kind of how I started was, was unpaid internship. I wonder if I can go back and get some money from uh, <laughs> the studio. All right, well, thank you so much. Round of applause for our guests. All right, are we offline?